online and in the room. We are um, really excited to have Dr. Tracy Weiler here today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce her. And as you know, we are, this is our second to last in the gender equity and ethics series. Um, we're going to be closing out next week um, on the 17th. Um, I'm going to be summarizing our talks today. So let me go ahead and introduce Dr. Weiler. She's an associate professor on the educator tract in the Department of Human and Molecular Genetics at Florida International University in Miami, Florida. She delivers a significant portion of the medical genetics education to the medical students at the Herbert Wytham College of Medicine. And she's also the academic program director of the Graduate Certificate in Molecular and Biomedical Sciences and a rigorous post-bac pre-med program that prepares students for medical school. She earned her PhD from the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, Canada in 2001, focusing on the genetics of muscular dystrophy in unique Manitoba populations. She moved to the US in 2006 to join the Cincinnati Children's Hospital and Medical Center, working on the genetics of juvenile idiopathic arthritis and treatment resistance. She moved to Miami in 2013. You got warmer and warmer and warmer, right? She that we were moving until there was no more stuff. Right. <laughs> uh, Dr. Weiler is a member of the AAMC Council on Faculty and Academic Societies, um, which she shared should be most of the data she's sharing today comes from that society um, and the Mission Alignment Committee since 2019. At the time, a working group of the Mission Alignment Committee has convened to study gender parity in academic medicine, both nationally and now at the level of the Academic Medical Center. So welcome, Dr. Weiler. Thank you so much for inviting us, us to talk to you today about our work. Um, this is similar to Julie. This is kind of a, um, an unfunded passion of, of ours as well. Um, so the talk I'm giving today is called Gender Disparities in Rank and Tenure at Academic Medical Centers. And I wish this would just go away, but we'll see if that's better. Um, I am, um, can we hide it? Excellent. Um. <laughs> um, I was supposed to be giving this talk with Dina Callamore from St. Louis University. Um, she sends her regrets. She had a family emergency and couldn't um, join us today. Um, financial disclosure wise, uh, we really have no actual or potential conflicts of interest in relation to this presentation. No grants, no products, no patents, no companies, etc. And we don't even know what that would look like for, for gender parity. But we do represent um, a work group of the Council of Faculty and Academic Societies, uh, but this is entirely volunteer. The other thing um, we, Dina and I, but all of the seven of us, we were really not, not huge fans of lecture format and would really like your participation today, whether it is on Zoom uh, through the chat or in person. Okay, so the work that we're I'm gonna be presenting today is, is based on this paper that we published in Academic Medicine in 2022. Um, entitled Rank and Tenure Amongst Faculty at Academic Medical Centers, a study of more than 50 years of gender disparities. And you can see the, uh, my colleagues that are a part of the working group here. Um, the, the individuals, Nandini Callamore is from St. Louis University, Eileen Cowan is from Madison, Wisconsin, um, Mark Danielson is from Georgetown. Anka Dobrian is at Eastern Virginia Medical Center. Um, Adam Franks, who is our fearless leader, really is from Marshall University. Serena Newman is at the Hampton VA, and I'm down in Florida in Miami. So the learning objectives for our talk, for this talk today and for this presentation are to appreciate the evolution of gender parity in academic medicine over the past 50 years. Um, describe the gender disparities in academic medicine with respect to basic and clinical science departments, um, academic rank and tenure status, and then recognize large historical changes that have happened in academic medicine 
that have shifted gender curves over the past half century. And so I'm going to start actually with a provocative question here, and that is, do you think that this current state of gender representation at your institution or in the nation nation um, broadly is adequate? What do you think gender representation means? How would you measure? What are your thoughts? I mean, I'm assuming, yeah. Right. It's better than it was. Absolutely, you're totally right. I'm glad you brought up this idea of, you know, if you're in pediatrics or you're in one of these other female-friendly-ish specialties, it's different than if you're in um, some other specialties. Anyone else have any comments? Yeah, right. So Julie was just saying that um, at the medical school level and at the residency level, our, 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 we are pretty close to even, but as we go further up, it's not. And it hasn't been that way for decades, right? Like we, have, we were just talking about this earlier. We had equal numbers of medical students in the 90s. And still, we do not have equal numbers of um, of, of, of people up at the um, associate and full professor level. Okay, um, so what does gender parity mean to you? Okay, Julie's saying equal pay, equal promotion. You guys agree? Equal representation, so equal numbers, yeah. Equal opportunity, yeah, okay. All right, so we took a very, ref very narrow view of what gender parity means because we couldn't do the we couldn't do the research without something um, that was very defined and and simple. Um, but lots of rich data came out of this definition. And what we defined, so we kind of split out different um, categories here, equality, parity, and equity, um, and defined them a bit differently. And so we define equality, as when the inputs are equal, right? So everybody is getting the same thing. We define equity as when outcomes are equal. And how you define outcomes is up for debate, right? But then we define parity as simply when the numbers are the same. So for gender parity, um, if we were to just talk about the binary uh, male, female, man, woman scenario, um, that would be 50-50 um, split. That is not to say that equity is not a goal, right? But this is where we started was with parity and just looking at the numbers. I really like this graph. This one actually came from Reddit, but um, there's lots of different versions of it. Um, in reality, we have some people who have, get much more than is needed. We have somebody who gets just what is needed and then somebody else who not only doesn't get what is needed, but actually is in a hole to start with. Um, this is kind of the current state of reality, right? Um, equality is when the inputs are the same, everybody gets a crate to stand on. For some people, it's does not needed. For others, it's not enough. And for some, it's still it's just fine. Equity is when you think about the outcomes, and then justice is when you remove the barriers to start with. So I'm hoping eventually we will get to justice, 
but um, that uh, that this is kind of how I look at these different different terms. Okay, so we're going to talk about faculty growth in academic medicine, um, and that comes from data that we have obtained from the AAMC faculty roster. So allopathic medical schools are members of the AAMC, accredited medical schools of the AAMC. And as such, you can create an account um, at the AAMC.org and sign in um, and access all kinds of great data. And when you do that, and you go to uh, the home screen, you can go over to data and reports, look at faculty and institutions and find the faculty roster. There is data there, extraordinary amounts of data there um, for faculty, but there are also several other databases that you can play with, including um, um, characteristics of medical schools, characteristics of medical school classes, for example. The faculty roster itself was initiated in 1966. So this is the first point I wanted to make is that the data starts when the database started, right? Um, to support national policy studies by collecting comprehensive information on the characteristics of faculty members at accredited US MD granting medical schools. So this data that we're gonna talk about today is not including DO schools, okay? And it is not including um, Canadian schools um, or international schools. And here is the link to that, um, to the faculty roster. Okay, so some clarifying definitions here, just for the purposes of um, this talk, <laughs> I'll keep dancing this thing around. Um, for the purposes of, of the uh, faculty roster, gender is defined as male and female. Non-binary um, um, genders were did not exist um, formally in the database, you know, or in in um, the world as a um, a recognized gender in 1966. And I don't think they've changed things. They haven't. Um, changed anything since. Regarding departments, um, we talk about faculty as members of either basic science departments and clinical science departments. So when I say this is BSc versus CSC, it doesn't matter whether I'm an MD or PhD, it, mem it matters whether I'm in, clin in a clinical department or a basic science department. Academic ranks that we looked at, assistant professor, associate professor, and full professor, these were pretty standard across most institutions. Um, there are other ranks that we, which actually comprises about 13% of faculty. And we kind of, the numbers of each of those were small and they were so varied as to be difficult to analyze. So we excluded them from our data. And then tenure, we looked at non-tenured, tenure track, and tenured um, professors. Okay, so let's just look at academic medical centers and faculty over time. You can see that the total number of faculty in 1966 was about 13,000 and has increased to about 157,000, which is about a 12-fold increase, pretty linear over that time about 3,000 faculty increasing every year over the past 55 years. Um, when we split that out into BSc faculty and CSC faculty, it's crazy. Um, we see that there is a 15-fold increase in clinical science faculty over these, um, these 50 years and a five-fold increase in faculty in the basic science side. Um, if you look carefully, you can kind of see a difference in the slopes here. So up until about 2000, we were just under 2000 um, faculty um, increasing per year. That almost doubled in the next um, 17 years, and it has really stabilized to about 1,268 um, in the past three years. We haven't done any more work since 2019. Um, 
when we zoom in, this looks pretty linear with a little skip here that is actually real. Um, when you zoom into that, and here we're looking at thousands, and here we're looking at absolute numbers, you can see three different slopes. Um, the first is about just about 500 people per year up to about 1976. And then 216, it's leveled off um, in the next uh, 30 years. And then just 64, an increase of 64 per year since then. So we still are increasing, but clinical faculty really is um, driving that increase. We think about why that might be. It might be because of academic medical centers increasing, right? The numbers of those cent of medical centers. And so if we look at that over the time, we see that there were just about 90 medical centers in 1966. And that has um, ended with about 140, uh, just about 150, I think it's 152 might be right now, um, increasing at a rate of about two and a half per year over the first um, um, almost you know, 10 years, and then stabilizing to almost no growth over the next um, decades. And then now up again, uh, increasing, not as quickly as it was at the beginning, but still an increase. And when we look at how that compares to medical students, um, what we see is a similar curve, which isn't surprising. Um, we increased 712 students per year over the first um, slope, and then another 399 per year going from here to there, and then 410 per year in the next um, gap. And this, this correlates really quite beautifully. Um, when we think about that, what that really means then, although CSC department faculty dominate the total volume, the BSC department faculty has the slopes and, and mirrors that medical school demand um, more, um, more closely. So what's driving that growth of clinical science faculty um, over these past 50 years. I'm going to leave that as a thought for you to consider. So now let's talk about gender parity. Um, both male and female um, numbers are increasing over time. You can see down here um, less than 20,000 total. Um, and up here, we're now in the almost 100,000 um, men. And when we put this same graph on a linear scale, 1,100, 1,200, um, sorry, uh, uh, women at the start and um, almost 12,000 for a tenfold difference at the start of the faculty roster to about a 1.5 fold uh, difference at the end um, in 2019, which is great. I mean, this is definitely, you know, one and a half is definitely better than um, tenfold. When we look at the, on a logarithmic scale, the difference between, um, you know, where men started and where they ended, an eightfold increase in men over these past 50 years, and a 53-fold increase in women. So we're doing something right. Um, so that's a, a, a good start. And if we change that to a measure of the percent female, um, we see that we started out at 9% and we are now up at 40%, which isn't, you know, it's not parity yet, but it's, it's definitely um, heading in the right direction and it's a nice slope. Initially, that slope was at about 0.3%, 0.35% per year until about 1982. And then that's about doubled almost um, to a 0.69% per year since. So, um, so I'm going to now put all this together into a kind of an academic medicine timeline that will, it's a bit complicated, so I'm going to do it a bit slowly. It's going to summarize a lot of that data. Um, medical center faculty have increased at about 3,000 per year, and really no changes. 
um, clinical science faculty have increased more um, in this middle period in the 2000s, and that has dropped off a bit since, started at about 2000 per year. Basic science faculty, these, these, um, this is a conditional formatting just from, you know, red is slow, <laughs> dark green is fast, and so yellow is kind of in the middle. So you can see 64 is the reddest. Um, we aren't getting very much increase in faculty, basic science faculty um, recently. Academic medical centers themselves um, over this increased a lot at the beginning, almost none, and then are in the in, um, kind of in an intermediate phase now. And similarly, um, that's paralleled by our student numbers. And we see that the percent female faculty has changed from 0.36% increase to 0.69% increase. So we see a very rapid expansion of academic medical centers um, in this time period. We, looking at what was going on in medicine at this time, we saw that there was a decreased federal, federal grant research funding um, in the 80s and 90s and decreased reimbursements for clinical activities. And we can start to correlate um, the things that are happening um, you know, with our numbers. Um, when we had this flip, uh, or not flip, but increase in um, percent female, um, we can kind of correlate that with an increased number of, of clinical faculty required um, and no men to do the job, so they hired women to do it. Um, at this point, we started to see the rise of the medical educator track, which was a, a, an advent, um, you know, a, a, a big inter, in, intervention in the um, early, late 90s and 2000s. And then again, we had another expansion that's still going on today um, with new medical schools. So as we move forward into some of the subsequent slides, I'm going to keep this up there and you can kind of, you know, rem remind yourself of, of kind of what was going on over time. So next question for you, is gender parity 50%, which for this purpose, we're defining as 50% female, 50% um, male, is that desirable? Is that what we want? What do you think? Yeah. Right. Right. And is there a, like, is there an error bar? Is 55 still parity? or you know 45 when is too little or too much too much right Interesting. So um, depending on the, the, the parity should reflect or the representation should reflect the patient population. That's a great idea. Um, yeah, I, I, I like that. Um, we we're doing a, actually Dina is doing a similar project on, on, gen, on, on race um, and is talking about um, parity being representations of races compared to the general population. And so um, that's an interesting way to think about it. Okay, um, so let's look at some historical changes associated with these gender curves um, and split out some of these things. It is hot in here, isn't it? We're going to start with academic rank, um, zoom in a bit, and look at how academic rank is um, has changed over time. 
So again, here is this same per, um, same thing that I was showing you earlier. I've just kind of put it up at the top to remind you of what's going on over time. And you can see that the basic science assistant professors pretty linear across the um, across the whole 50 years and a rate of change of about 0.5% female per year um, consistently. The clinical folks are changing differently. Um, we saw a, a shift in 1977. Okay, we saw another shift in 1994, and the rate of change went from 1% uh, percent per year and, and shifted downward. So this is where our basic science, we think that there might have been something going on right up front. And then our clinical science in 1977, and then again, another um, change in 1994. Associate professors, so what was going on here? Actually, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, when the clinical science folks started to really ramp up here, we were in finishing up a stage of rapid growth. But at the same time, remember, this is a stage when we had reduced uh, funding for clinical work and we had reduced research funding. And so, the hypothesis we have is that um, they hired a lot of um, clinical folks to drive the academic enterprise because that's the only money, that's where the money could come from. Uh, at the same time, medical schools turned into academic medical centers and pulled in the hospital systems and all of those people from the hospital system also all of a sudden became faculty in, um, in, in the medical schools. So at the associate professor level, as you can see, the rate of change has an, is no different from assistants to associates. For basic science, we have um, just a chain, a, a consistent half a percent for year per year. And we're reaching up to 40%, almost 40% now. One last thing I wanted to say about assistance, we're up at 48, 45% for basic science and really close to parity for clinical folks. Um, so at this level, we're doing right. We're doing, we're doing a good thing. For associate professors, um, our clinical science folks have a, a change at, in about 1977 um, and, sorry, in, in 1985. And if you remember from our previous slide, the basic, the, the assistant professors had a change at 70, in 1977. So this is a kind of promotion. Um, people entered in, you know, in that, you know, kind of a more of a bolus in 77 and are graduating on to become associates in 85. And so we're seeing an increase um, um, of, of um, almost, you know, three quarters of a percentage point annually to date. When we look at full professors now, um, we see things change a bit. Basic science full professors all of a sudden have a, um, a, 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 a point, a change point here, starting at 0.23% annually and changing in about 1986 to about the same rate as the other assistants and the associates. And we think what's happening here is that there was this increase when funding was good and academic medical school centers were increasing, there were a lot of new folks who came in as assistant professors and you saw a little bit of a blip in that first graph. We think those people are starting to graduate into the full professor category um, by 1985. On the clinical science side, we see some other differences, 1980. Um, our associates are moving into full professors. Um, in 1994, we've got another blip. What happened here, this is when, again, our funding was low, right? 
and we saw an increase um, in, we were, uh, sorry, we have low amounts of MDs, um, MD schools and the MD students at this point. And so um, people are, the, I think the hypothesis here is this might be about the time when medical educators started to become more, um, more prevalent. If we haven't done this work yet, but it would be interesting for us to look to see what the proportion of, of gen, uh, you know, the, the percent female for medical educator faculty versus the, the, the straight clinical faculty and so on. We haven't, we haven't teased that out yet. But the other thing to note is the axis here is different. Um, now we're down at 30%. And so our basic science full professors are at less than 30% as are our clinical science full professors. If when you were a medical student, medical students were at parity, by now full professors should be close and that's not happening. So, um, to summarize this, uh, we see large periods of stable rates. Um, and then we see changes that we assume coincide with large events that are happening in academic medicine, medical educator track, um, rapid expansion events, and then decreased funding um, for both clinical and research are um, changing things. So what about tenure? How does tenure look? <laughs> um, the gap is closing um, for non-tenure track faculty. But what is interesting, look at this. This is in hundreds, this axis. So this is almost 150,000 people. Um, you can see how the increase is being driven by, of, of total faculty is being driven by the non-tenure track faculty. Um, an 106 fold increase in non tenure track faculty over these this time period, which is 71%, sorry, 71 times um, uh, for the males and 240 fold increase for the females. So that's good. Um, we are improving, um, but we're not. Uh, not at parity yet. Closest here though in non-tenure track. Um, and you can see the, the, the change point is at about the year 2000. So right in the middle of the stagnant point for growth, as well as the funding, you know, is stagnant as well. So then we think about tenure track. Notice the, the, the axis here, rather than 150,000 people here, we're now talking about 25,000 people. Um, lots of changes over this time. The women are improving quite consistently. And the men have, stable, have, have stabilized in the past 20 years. So their increase over time, over this past, um, the men have increased at an eightfold rate and women have increased at a ninefold rate for tenure track faculty. And I popped these things in here, but I have difficulty mapping this. One of the concerns that we have with tenure track is that Tenure track faculty often have to be um, basic science or um, full professors, right? If you were a medical educator, you're not, I am a med medical educator, I'm not eligible to be on the tenure track. Um, and so as we are increasing the tenure track and as we are increasing clinical folks with an entirely clinical practice, um, they aren't eligible to be on that tenure track. No. Um, tenure track, well, 
there are requirements from budget budget wise right and department wise and so people will say oh we can only have you know we've lost one tenure track person we need to get another one or whatever but there's no defined limits yes yes we think that is one of the biggest things that we can do to make this a better situation as males retire replace them with females <laughs> All right, so if we then look at tenured faculty, turns out that female tenured faculty are actually increasing, as you can see here. And male tenured faculty, although they increased up until 1994 and then stabilized over the next 10 years, then they have been dropping since. So, and as you can see here, our total number of tenured faculty is pretty solid, which again supports that as the tenured males are retiring, they must be being replaced by tenured females. And so this delta here is fourfold. So we still, at this point in time, have a fourfold higher um, number of, of males in tenured positions than females. Okay, so when do we get to parity? <laughs> this is the question. Um, and we had um, some, we did some statistics to figure this stuff out. And really um, assistant professors will reach parity in less than 10 years if we maintain our course the way it currently stands. So 2023, um, based on our projections, if we were to do this analysis again, we would hope that we would be um, at that position. And then the question becomes, are we gonna continue that trajectory or are we going to ease off? Because policies must change in order for us to change our trajectory. The major things must happen in order for it to, us to change our trajectory. Basic science, 2034. So another 10 years for um, basic science assistant professors um, to reach parity. At the associate professor level, 2033. So about the time the basic science assistants will reach parity, we think our clinical science associates would reach parity, but our basic science associates, um, not for another 25 years um, to 2047. And the bad news is here with the full professors. Um, clinical science full professors aren't going to reach parity if we don't make any changes until 2053. And basic science, 2065. I don't think I'm going to be around long enough to see that happen. And remember, when we're talking about these, these are clinical science departments and basic science departments, right? So... So if you, I am a PhD in a, you know, in the genetics basic science department, but if I were in the clinical, you know, in a clinical department like internal medicine, I would be in cal cal classified in this category. So that's pretty much the data that we wanted to present to you. And, um, our message in the paper is that large act changes in academic medicine. Um, we talked about the changes in the numbers of medical centers, changes in reimbursement rates, changes in grant funding, changes in um, tracks, right? Those things have um, been impactful changes in academic medicine that might 
that have altered our steady state over the past um, 50 years. And so what do you think is coming next? What is gonna alter our steady state? Yeah. Mm. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, maternal parental leave in general. Um, where I live and work, um, there is a pervasive attitude that if you are not in the on the campus visible you must not be working as hard as you could be and so there's a very big push for us to be on campus all the time and when i my commute is you know 45 minutes on a good day and two hours on a bad day, and we've got, um, then I get to chat with people and not do work. I am considerably less productive when I'm at work than when I am at home. Because in my, my family keeps saying, you know, when you're commuting, if you're not commuting, that's Tracy time. That's not FIU time. But I just think of it as bonus time that I can get my stuff done, right? So... I think we, as a team, think that this is this is where we've got to go to make change, right? We've got to be intentional about making these changes, recognize that giant changes have to occur system-wide in order for us to really make a difference um, and 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 improve our trajectories. And then the next provocative question really is this idea that, and up until now, really most of what we've been talking about has been volume-based change, right? We need more people to make more money to produce, you know, to, to produce the students or to run the medical center um, or to, um, um, you know, account for all of these residents that we need to train. So we need more medical educators. But our idea is that that's not enough and we won't um, get there in any reasonable amount of time continuing that kind of thinking. And that we need to start to shift our thinking to more value-based policies, which comes at some of the things that you guys have been raising here. And so when we think about value in academic medicine um, at a quantitative level, and this is, this is work that we are now um, doing for our second um, paper, where we are trying to create a metric by which we can and score individual uh, medical schools on the basis of things that we think are important um, in terms of, of academic medicine at the faculty level. So one thing, it's important that we just have people, right? We have um, women, men um, at equal levels in positions. So we call that um, the numbers or the total amount. Then we th think we have the what's called the advancement measure. And we um, 
you know, you can have parity at assistant professors, but that's kind of tokenism, right? What we really need is parity at full professors because the full professors are the ones that drive the policy. Um, and so we have created an advancement kind of um, portion of our metric to say, let's count the number of, of full professors, let's count the number of tenured faculty we have um, and use that as a portion of our, um, our value-based um, system. And then the last one is leadership. Um, we haven't done the work in this particular uh, paper, but department chairs, percent female is less than 30%. Um, C-suite, probably less than that. Deans, definitely less than that. Um, and we need those to be up there too, right? And so in our, um, our metric that, that we are going to use to score medical schools, we are kind of incorporating just total percent F as well as an advancement measure and a leadership measure to kind of reflect all of the things that we value um, as academic, uh, as members of the academic fac medicine faculty. We are in the midst of that work and trying to figure out um, where to take it. Um, but there are also intrinsic cultural characteristics of institutions that make some good and at parity already and others very, very not at parity, um, very, very disparate um, levels of males and females. And so one of the other things that we wanna do is um, look at intrinsic cultural characteristics of these institutions. Um, what does salary look like? And does, does salary, which kind of you would think is a, you know, an equality thing, right? It's an input into the system. Um, is this fact that salary is, is not um, at, at, at parity resulting in women dropping out? Um, daycare, availability of daycare, availability of daycare close to where you are, availability of daycare that, that, that fits the needs of a, of a mom who's, you know, in the hospital for 30 hours at a stretch. And then those moms that are still breastfeeding, for example, they need accommodations to be able to do that. And Eileen has a brand new baby. I think the baby's maybe seven or eight months old. It's her eyes have just, you know, opened so much to, um, to these kinds of things. Work at home options. Um, for all kinds of different reasons. Mentorship and sponsorship. We often hear that um, um, the, the males are sponsored or mentored more frequently than the females. And so the timeline of, of promotion from assistant to associate, from associate to full is one level for males and it's stretched for females because these things are different and there is an extra level of struggle there, um, which gets back to my um, initial reality slide where we were dug into a hole before we begin. Faculty development support as well. Um, and so, this is an opportunity for you to provide your thoughts and I can type them in. Um, what do you think are value-based um, characteristics of medical schools that can, that we might be able to kind of more broadly implement to make change, to increase gender parity? in less than 40 years. Yeah. 
difference today is when you look sort of at medical schools as a whole, you get a view that looks much better than if you look at individual subspecies or subspecies of surgery. Absolutely. Those can be extraordinarily so, so I do think that uh, it's you know if, if, if it's more medical centers or medical schools on the whole they look very absolutely. Very so I would argue that we never look very well, almost never look very good. Um, but you, you saw that as we were just talking about medical school, our, our increase is at 40%. We've been 12 fold increase. We're doing not badly until you split it out and whether you split it out into rank tenure. Um, one, one of the things that we have found in this work is that when a specialty is considered male dominated salaries are higher and there's a whole lot of cachet etc cetera, etc cetera, that goes along with it that gets removed once the women move in yeah Right. One of the things that one of the other things to consider about the um, about the faculty roster is that the data is self-reported, but it's self-reported at the medical school level. So I really have no idea how I am reported right, to the AAMC. Um, I'm hoping that I'm reported as basic science um, associate professor, but I really, non-tenure track, right, because that's reality, but I don't know. Um, so that's, a, it's self-reported. Um, I don't know how the cleanup is done, um, but yeah, and and really, you know, for it, one of the other things that's that's interesting at FIU right now, we don't have a clinical partner. Um, so we have a bunch of community hospitals, and the folks that work in those hospitals are clinical, like they are employed by the hospital. They are voluntary faculty with us, so we have thousands of voluntary faculty, but our Hardcore FIU, HW Com faculty is about 150. Um, most full-time, but some version of part-time as well. What that looks like in different places is different, right? So Georgetown, where um, Mark Danielson's from, they have MedStar. And MedStar employs the all of the clinical faculty, right? At all of the MedStar places, and they all have an appointment and are faculty at Georgetown. So they have thousand, I don't know how many thousand people they have. Some of them are just 
clinical folks. Some have clinical and educational responsibilities. Some do research, et cetera. So it's, I don't know. Okay, sure. Yeah. Yeah, so the last question is, yeah. have policies implemented improved gender parity? I don't think anything much has changed. And where do we go now, really? Yeah, well, that's it. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. Um, the last question, the one of the questions that came online was, um, thanks for the wonderful talk. We're worried that COVID has set back the trajectory for gender equity among faculty. Um, Oh, are we worried that COVID has set back the trajectory for gender equity among faculty and would be interested in knowing how to ensure that we get there faster, um, especially with the concern of attrition, like people leaving after COVID, I think. Yeah, so the data that we've seen, although we haven't done that work, we the data we captured started, ended right as COVID started, mm -hmm. but um, women took the burden of of family care, of, of so much of this stuff. And that has probably stretched out some of their, um, their trajectory. Mm -hmm. Some of them have said, I give, I can't, and have left. Um, so yeah, I do think it's probably yeah. set us back. Yeah. And you know, to your point about creating policies for promotion and tenure, we need to keep in mind that people have a life outside of this place, right? And what is good for women is going to also be good for men too. And, you know, that will allow men to become more, um, you know, take care of their families too. And so, you know, it's kind of like universal design principles. If we can do stuff, may implement policy that can change, every, you know, change policies that so that everybody, you know, is 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 ben benefits. I think that's the way it's got to go. I guess my my last question is like, as there's been like a decrease in private practice, you know, the numbers of private practice, like as academic medical centers, at least here in Chicago you know, we're buying up private practices, we're like expanding, we're like, everything is, um, you know, fallen under the academic medical center mm -hmm. and there are fewer and fewer private practices. How do you think that affects your data? Or do you think that is the rise in the, some of the rise of the academic medical center is as they became more, or for instance, like if FIU were to like take all those volunteer faculty and make them- Like Georgetown did. Yeah, right. How, would, how does that affect that data? Well, I think that is the, there was a significant increase in the 80s when we went from 0.36 to 0.67, right? And I think we think that was when a lot of people started buying up medical center, buying up, um, you know, include pulling more people into the academic medical center and a whole lot of women came with it. Um, we think that's what was going on there. Yeah. That yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for this talk. You're um, we usually um, end the recording um, online. Uh, you don't have to do it. Renana will do it for us. And then, um, and then I, 